Chapter 10 I had strange dreams in that house that night. I woke myself in the darkness, and I knew only that a dream had scared me so badly that I had to wake up or die. And yet, try as I might, I could not remember what I had dreamed. The dream was haunting me, standing behind me, present and yet invisible, like the back of my head, simultaneously there and not there. I missed my father, and I missed my mother, and I missed my bed in my house, only a mile or so away. I missed yesterday, before Ursula Monkton, before my father's anger, before the bathtub. I wanted that yesterday back, and I wanted it back so badly. I tried to pull the dream, but it upset me so to the front of my mind, but it wouldn't come. There had been betrayal in it, I knew, and loss, and time. The dream had left me so scared to go back to sleep, and the fireplace was almost dark now, with only the deep red glow of the embers in the hearth to mark that it had once been burning, once had given light. I climbed down from the four-poster bed, and I felt beneath it until I found the heavy china chamber pot. I hitched up my nightgown, and I used it, and then I walked to the window and looked out. The moon was still full, but now it was low in the sky in a dark orange. What my mother called a harvest moon, that things were harvested in autumn, I knew, not in spring. In the orange moonlight I could see the old woman. I was almost certain it was old Mrs. Hempstock, although it was hard to see her face properly, walking up and down. She had a big, long stick she was leaning on as she walked like a staff. She reminded me of the soldiers I had seen on their trip to London outside of Buckingham Palace, as they marched backwards and forwards on parade. I watched her, and I was comforted. I climbed back into my bed in the dark, laying my head on the empty pillow, and I thought, I'll never go back to sleep. Not now. And then I opened my eyes and saw that it was morning. There were clothes that I had never seen before on the chair by the bed. There were two china jugs of water, one steaming hot, one cold, beside a white china bowl that I realized was a hand basin, set into a small wooden table. The fluffy black kitten had returned to the foot of the bed. It opened its eyes as I got up. They were vivid blue-green and unnatural and odd, like the sea in the summer, and it mewed a high-pitched questioning noise. I stroked it, and then I got out of bed. I mixed the hot water and the cold in the basin, and I washed my face and my hands. I cleaned my teeth with the cold water. There was no toothpaste, but there was a small round tin box in which was written, Max Melton's remarkably officious tooth powder in old-fashioned letters. I put some of the white powder on the green toothbrush and cleaned my teeth with it. It tasted minty and lemony in my mouth. I examined the clothes that had been left out for me. They were unlike anything I had ever worn before. There were no underpants. There was a white undershirt with no buttons, but with a long shirt tail, and there were brown trousers that were stopped at the knees, a pair of long white stockings and a chestnut-colored jacket with a V cut into the back, like a swallow's tail. The light brown socks were more like stockings. I put the clothes on best I could, wishing there were zips or clasps rather than hooks and buttons and stiff, unyielding buttonholes. The shoes had silver buckles in front, but the shoes were too big and did not fit me, so I went out to the room in my stocking feet, and the kitten followed me. To reach my room the night before, I had walked upstairs, and at the top of the stairs turned left. Now I turned right and walked past Letty's bedroom. The door was ajar, the room was empty and made for the stairs. But the stairs were not where I remembered them. The corridor ended in a blank wall and a window that looked out over the woodlands and the fields. The black kitten with the heavy blue-green eyes mewed loudly as if to attract my attention and turned back down the corridor in a self-important strut, tail held high. It led me down the hall, round the corner, and down a passage I had never seen before to the staircase. The kitten bounced amiably down the stairs, and I followed. Jenny Hempstock was standing at the foot of the stairs. You've slept long and well, she said. We've already milked the cows. Your breakfast is on the table, and there's a saucer of cream by the fireplace for your friend. Where's Letty, Mrs. Hempstock? Oh, off on an errand, getting stuff she may need. Uh, it has to go, the thing at your house, or there will be trouble and worse will follow. She's already bound at once, and it slipped the bounds, so she needs to send it home. I just want Ursula Monkton to go away. I hate her, I said. Jenny Hempstock put out a finger, ran it across my jacket. It's not what anyone else hereabouts is wearing these days, she said. But my man put a little glamour on it, so it's not as if anyone will notice. You'll walk around in it all you want, not a soul will think there's anything odd about it. No shoes? Ah, they didn't fit. I'll leave something that'll fit, that'll fit you by the back door, then. Thank you, I said. She said, I don't hate her. She does what she does according to her nature. She was asleep. She woke up. She's trying to give everyone what they want. She hasn't given me anything I want. She says she wants to put me in the attic. 
Perhaps, as may be, you were her way home, and that's a dangerous thing to be a door. She tapped my chest above my heart with her forefinger, and she was better off where she was. We would have sent her home lace safely. Done it before for her kind dozens of times, but she's headstrong, that one. No teaching them. Right, uh, your breakfast is on the table. Little will be in the nine, I'll be in the nine-acre field if anyone needs me. There was a bowl of porridge on the kitchen table, and beside it, a saucer with a lump of golden honeycomb on it and a jug of rich yellow cream. I opened, I spooned up the lump of honeycomb and mixed it into the thick porridge, and then I poured the cream in. There was toast, too, cooked beneath the grill of my, as my father cooked it, and homemade blackberry jam. There was the best cup of tea I had ever drunk. By the fireplace, the kitten lapped at a saucer of creamy milk and poured so loudly I could hear it across the room. I wished I could purr, too. I would have purred then. Letty came in, carrying a shopping bag, the old-fashioned kind you never seem to see any more. Elderly women used to carry them in the shops. Big woven bags that were almost baskets. Raffia worked out of the side and lined with cloth with rope handles. This basket was almost full. Her cheek had been scratched and had bled, although the blood had dried. She looked miserable. Hello, I said. Well, she said, let me tell you, if you think that was fun, that wasn't any fun. Not one bit. Mandrakes are so loud when you pull them up, and I didn't have earplugs, and once I got it, I had to swap it for some shadow bottles, an old-fashioned one with lots of shadows dissolved in vinegar. She buttered some toast and then crushed a lump of golden honeycomb into it and started munching. And that was just to get me to the bazaar, and then they weren't even meant to be open yet. <sighs> but I got most of what I needed there. Can I look? If you want to. I looked into the basket. It was filled with broken toys, doll's eyes and heads and hands, cars with no wheels, chipped cat's eyes, glass, marbles. Letty reached up and took down a jar of jam from the window ledge. Inside it, the silvery translucent wormhole shifted and twisted and spiraled and turned. Letty dropped the jam jar into the shopping bag with broken toys. The kitten slept and ignored us entirely. Letty said, you don't have to come with for this bit. You can stay here while I go and talk to her. I thought about it. I feel safer with you, I told her. She didn't look happy at this. She said, let's go down to the ocean. The kitten opened its two green and blue eyes and stared at us disinterestedly as we left. There was a pair of black leather boots, like riding boots, waiting for me by the back door. They looked old, but well cared for, and just my size. I put them on, although I felt more comfortable in sandals. Together, Letty and I walked down to her ocean, by which I meant the pond. We sat on the old bench and looked at the placid brown surface of the pond and the lily pads and the scum of duckweed by the water's edge. You pimp stocks aren't people, I said. Are two? I shook my head. I bet you don't even actually look like that, I said. Not really. Letty shrugged. Nobody actually looks like they really are on the inside. You don't. I don't. People are much more complicated than that. It's true of everybody. I said, are you a monster like Ursula Moncton? Letty threw a pebble into the pond. I don't think so. Monsters come in all shapes and sizes. Some of them are things people are scared of, and some of them are things that look like things people used to be scared of a long time ago. Sometimes monsters are things people should be scared of, but they aren't. I said, people should be scared of Ursula Moncton. Perhaps. What do you think Ursula Moncton is scared of? Dunno. Why do you think she's scared of anything? She's a grown-up, isn't she? Grown-ups and monsters aren't scared of things. Monsters are scared, said Letty. That's why they're monsters, and as for grown-ups. She stopped talking, rubbed her freckled nose with a finger, then, I'm going to tell you something important. Grown-ups don't look like grown-ups on the inside, either. Outside, they're big and thoughtless, and they always know what they're doing. Inside, they look just like they always have, like they did when they were your age. The truth is, there aren't any grown-ups. Not one in the whole wide world. She thought for a moment, and then she smiled. Except for Granny, of course. We sat there, side by side, on the old wooden bench, not saying anything. I thought about adults, and I wondered if that were true, if they were all really children wrapped in adult bodies, like children's books hidden in the middle of a dull, long adult book, the kinds with no pictures or conversations. I love my ocean, Letty said. And I knew our time by the pond was done. It's just pretending, though, I told her, feeling like I was letting childhood down by admitting it. Your pond? It's not an ocean. It can't be. Oceans are bigger than seas. Your pond is just a pond. It's as big as it needs to be, said Letty Hempstock, nettled. She sighed. 
We'd better get on with sending Ursula What's-Her-Name back to where she came from. Then she said, I do know what she's scared of. And you know what? I'm scared of them too. The kitten was nowhere to be seen when we returned to the kitchen, although the fog-colored cat was sitting in the window still staring out at the world. The breakfast things had all been tidied up and put away, and the red pajamas and the dressing gown neatly folded were waiting for me on the table, in a large brown paper bag, along with my green toothbrush. You won't let her get me, will you? I asked Letty. She shook her head, and together we walked up the winding, flinty lane that led me to my house, and to the thing who called herself Ursula Monkton. I carried the brown paper bag with my knife gown in it, and Letty carried her too big for her raffia shopping bag filled with broken toys, which she had obtained in exchange for a mandrake that screamed and shadows dissolved in vinegar. Children, as I have said, use back ways and hidden paths while adults take roads and official paths. We went off the road and took a shortcut that Letty knew that took us through some fields and then to the extensive abandoned gardens of rich man's climbing houses, and then back onto the lane again. We came out just before the place where I had gone over the metal fence. Letty sniffed the air. No varmints yet, she said. That's good. What are varmints? She said only, eh, you'll know them when you see them, and I hope you never see them. Are we going to sneak in? Why would we do that? We'll go up the drive and through the front door like gentry. She started up the drive, and I said, Are you going to make a spell and send her away? Oh, we don't do spells, she said. She sounded a little disappointed to admit it. We'll do recipes sometimes, but no spells or cantrips. Gran doesn't hold none of that. She says it's common. So what's the stuff in the shopping bag for, then? It's to stop things traveling when you don't want them to. Mark boundaries. In the, meet, in the morning sunlight, my house looked so welcoming and so friendly with its warm red, red bricks and red tile roof. Letty reached into the shopping bag. She took a marble from it and pushed it into the still damp soil. Then, instead of going into the house, she turned left, walking the edge of the property. By Mr. Woolery's vegetable patch, we stopped, and she took something else from her shopping bag, a headless, legless, pink doll body with badly chewed hands. She buried it beside the pea plants. We picked some pea pods and opened them and ate the peas inside. Peas baffled me. I could not understand why grown-ups would take things that tasted so good when they were freshly picked and raw and put them in tin cans and make them revolting. Letty placed a toy giraffe in a small plastic kind that you find in a children's zoo or a Noah's Ark in the coal shed beneath a large lump of coal. The coal shed smelled of damp and blackness and of old, crushed forests. Will these things make her go away? No. Then what are they for? To stop her from going away. But we want her to go away. No, we want her to go home. I stared at her with a short, brownish red hair, her snub nose, her freckles. She looked three or four years older than me. She might have been three or four hundred years older than me, or thousands of times older again. I would have trusted her to the gates of Helen back. But still. I wish you'd explain properly. You talk in mysteries all the time. I was not scared, though, and I couldn't have told you why I wasn't scared. I trusted Letty just as I trusted her when we had gone to this insert the flapping thing beneath the orange sky. I believed in her, and that mean meant I would come to no harm while I was with her. I knew it in a way I knew the grass was green, that roses were sharp, woody thorns, that breakfast cereal was sweet. We went into my house through the front door. It was not locked. Unless we went away on holidays, I don't even remember it being locked, and we went inside. My sister was practicing the piano in the front room. We went in, and she heard the noise, stopped playing chopsticks, and turned around. She looked at me curiously. What happened last night? she asked. I thought you were in trouble, but then Mommy and Daddy came back, and you were just staying with your friend. Why would they say you were sleeping at your friend's? You don't have any friends. She noticed Letty, and then she said, Who's this? My friend, I told her. Where's that horrible monster? Don't call her that, said my sister. She's nice. She's having a lie down. My sister did not say anything about the strange clothes. Letty Hempstock took a broken xylophone from her shopping bag and dropped it on with a scree of toys that had accumulated between the piano and the blue toy box with a detached lid. There, she said. Now it's time to go and say hello. The first faint stirrings of fear inside my chest, inside my mind. Go up to her room, you mean? Yep. What's she doing up there? Doing things to people's lives, said Letty. Only local people so far. She finds what they think they need, and she tries to give it to them. She's doing it to make the world into something she'll be happier in. Some are more comfortable for her. Some are cleaner. She doesn't care so much about giving them money. Not anymore. Now what she cares about more is people hurting. 
As we went up the stairs, Letty placed something on each step. A clear glass marble with a twist of green inside. One of the little metal objects you call uh, knuckle bones. A bead, a pair of bright blue doll's eyes connected at the back with white plastic to make them open and close. A small red and white horseshoe magnet, a black pebble, a badge, the kind that came attached to birthday cards with I am seven on it. A book of matches, a plastic ladybird with a black magnet at the base. A toy car, half squished, its wheels gone. And last of all, a lead soldier. It was missing a leg. We were at the top of the stairs. The bedroom door was closed. Letty said, she won't put you in the attic. Then, without knocking, she opened the door and went into the bedroom that had once been mine, and reluctantly, I followed. Ursula Moncton was laying on the bed with her eyes closed. She was the first adult woman who was not my mother that I had seen naked, and I glanced at her curiously, but the room was more interesting to me than she was. It was my old bedroom, but it wasn't. Not anymore. There was a little yellow hand basin just my size, and the walls were still robin egg blue as they had been when it was mine, but now strips of cloth hung from the ceiling, gray, ragged cloth strips, like bandages. Some only a foot long, others dragging almost all the way to the floor. The window was open and the wind rustled and pushed them, so as they swayed grayly, it seemed as if perhaps the room was moving like a tent or a ship at sea. You have to go now, said Letty. Ursula Moncton sat up on the bed and then she opened her eyes, which were now the same gray as the hanging cloths. She said, in a voice that still sounded half asleep, I wondered what I would have to do to bring you both here. And look, you came. You didn't bring us here, Letty said. We came because we wanted to, and I came to give you one last chance to go. I'm not going anywhere, said Ursula Moncton, and she sounded petulant, like a very small child who wanted something. I've only just got here. I have a house here now. I have pets. His father is just the sweetest man. I'm making people happy. There's nothing like me anywhere in this whole world. I was looking just now when you came in. I'm the only one there is. They can't defend themselves. They don't know how. This is the best place in the whole of creation. She smiled at both of us brightly. She really was pretty for a grown-up. But when you are seven, beauty is an abstraction and not an imperative. I wonder what I would have done if she had smiled at me like that now. Whether I would have handed her my mind or my heart or my identity for her to be asking, as my father did. You think this world's like that, said Letty? You think it's easy, but it ain't. Of course it is. What are you saying? That you and your family will defend this world against me? You're the only one who ever leaves the border of your farm. And you tried to bind me without even knowing my name. Your mother wouldn't have been that foolish. I'm not scared of you, little girl. Letty reached deep into the shopping bag. She pulled out the jam jar with a translucent wormhole inside and held it out. Here's your way back, she said. I'm being kind. I'm being nice. Trust me. Take it. I don't think you can get any further to home than the place we met you with the orange sky. But that's far enough. I can't get you from there to where you came from in the first place. I asked Gran, and she says it isn't even there anymore. But once you're back, we can find a place for you, somewhere similar, somewhere you'll be happy, somewhere you'll be safe. Ursula Moncton got off the bed. She stood up and looked down at us. There was no lightnings wreathing her, not any longer, but she was scarier standing naked in that bedroom than she had been floating in a storm. She was an adult, no more than an adult. She was old and I never felt more like a child. I'm so happy here, so very, very happy. And then she said almost regretfully, you are not. I heard a sound of soft, raggedy flapping around. The gray claws began to detach themselves from the ceiling one by one, and they fell, but not in a straight line. They fell towards us from all over the room as if they were magnets, pulling them towards our bodies. The first strip of gray cloth landed on the back of my left hand, and it stuck there. I reached out my right hand and grabbed it, and I pulled the cloth off. It adhered for a moment. And as it was pulled off, it made a sucking sound. There was a discolored patch on the back of my left hand where the cloth had been, and it was as red as if I'd been sucking on it for a long, long time, longer and harder than I ever had in real life. And it was beaded with blood. There were pinpricks of red wetness. It smeared as I touched it, and then a long bandaged cloth began to attach itself to my legs, 
and I moved away as a cloth landed on my face and my forehead and another wrapped itself over my eyes, blinding me. So I pulled out a pat cloth to my eyes, but now another cloth circled my wrist, bound them together in my arms, and wrapped and bound to my body, and I stumbled and fell to the floor. If I pulled against the cloths, they hurt me. My world was gray. I gave up then, and I lay there, and I did not move, and I concentrated only on breathing, and through the space and the cloth strips had leapt for my nose. They held me, and I felt alive. I lay on the carpet, and I listened. There was nothing else I could do. Ursula said, I need the boy safe. I promised I'd keep him in the attic, so the attic it shall be. But you, little farm girl, what shall I do with you? Something appropriate. Perhaps I ought to turn you inside out so your heart and brains and flesh are all naked and exposed on the outside and the skin side inside. Then I'll keep you wrapped up in my room here with your eyes staring forever at the darkness inside yourself. I can do that. No, said Letty. She sounded sad, I thought. Actually, you can't. And I gave you your chance. You threatened me. Empty threat. Don't make threats, said Letty. I really wanted you to have a chance. And then she said, When you looked around the world for things like you, didn't you wonder why there weren't lots of other old things around? No, you never wondered. You were so happy it was just you here. You never stopped to think. Gran always calls your sort of things fleas. Scatch thratch of, of the keep. I mean... She could call you anything. I think she thinks fleas is funny. She doesn't mind your kind. She says you're harmless enough, just a bit stupid. That's because there are things that eat fleas in this part of creation. Varmints, Grants calls them. She doesn't like them at all. She says they're mean and they're hard to get rid of and they're always hungry. I'm not scared, said Ursula Monkton. She sounded scared. And then she said, how did you know my name? Went looking for it this morning. Went looking for other things, too. Some boundary markers to keep you from running too far, getting into too much trouble. And a trail of breadcrumbs that leads straight here to this room. Now, open the jam jar, take out the doorway, and let's send you home. I waited for Ursula Monkton to respond, but she said nothing. There was no answer. Only the slamming of the door and the sound of footsteps, fast and pounding down the stairs. Letty's voice was close to me, and it said, She would have been better off staying here and taking me up on my offer. I felt her hands tugging at the claws on my face. They came free with a wet, sucking sound, but they no longer felt alive, and when they came off, they fell to the ground and lay there, unmoving. This time there was no blood beaded on my skin. The worst thing that had happened was that my arm and legs had gone to sleep. Letty helped me to my feet. She did not look happy. Where did she go? I asked. She's followed the trail out of the house, and she's scared, poor thing. She is so scared. You're scared, too. A bit. Yes, right. Uh, about now she's going to be fine that she's trapped inside the bounds I put down, I expect. We went out of the bedroom where the toy soldier at the top of the stairs had been. There was now a rip. That's the best I can describe it as if someone had taken a photograph of the stairs and then torn out the soldier from the photograph. There was nothing in the space where the soldier had been, but dim grayness that hurt my eyes if I looked at it too long. What is she scared of? You heard. Varmints. Are you scared of varmints, Letty? She hesitated just a moment too long, and then she simply said, Yes. But you aren't scared of her, of Ursula. I, I can't be scared of her. It's just like Grand says. She's like a flea, all puffed up with pride and power and lust, like a flea bloated with blood. But she couldn't have hurt me. I've seen off dozens like her in my time. One has come through in Cromwell's day. Now there was something to talk about. He made folks lonely, that one. They'd hurt themselves just to make the loneliness stop, gouge out their eyes, jump down wells, and all the while they had this great lummocking thing sits in the cellar of the Duke's head, looking like a squat toad, big as a bulldog. We were at the bottom of the stairs, walking down the hall. How do you know where she went? Oh, she couldn't have gone anywhere but the way I laid out for. In the front room, my sister was still playing chopsticks on the piano. da 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 da
He was nasty, that one, back in Cromwell's day. But we got him out of here just before the hunger birds came. Hunger birds? What Graham calls varmints, the cleaners. They didn't sound bad. I knew that Ursula had been scared of them, but I wasn't. Why would you be scared of cleaners? 